we're so grateful that you're here. Just thankful for the Lord today. And uh, just want you to know, because he lives, we can live. Galatians 2.20 reminds us. Uh, Paul says, um, for me to live is Christ. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Uh, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And because Christ lives, we can to live. And that's what this song is about. I believe in the sun, I believe in the risen one, I believe I overcome by the power of his blood, amen, amen. Because he lives, we can live too. So grateful for that. Now, Acts chapter 15, and uh, our guys will take care of that and bring one to you. But Acts chapter 15, we have been on a journey through the book of Acts, uh, uh, sort of speak. And we've learned about this Apostle Paul whose name was Saul. And right now, the Apostle Paul is on his first missionary journey. And I have a map there that will show you this. And if you'd follow that red circle that just came down, you'll see this is encompassing Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul's first missionary journey. And we are learning how Paul uh, made God big in his life and how Paul reduced himself because Paul thought he was the big guy. He thought he was the big man on campus and rightly so. He had a great education and upbringing and, and doing all that. And we've studied all, all that out, but we want to learn because the book of Acts is full of opposition. Have you ever had opposition in your life? Have you ever had someone 
uh, to talk negative about you? Have you ever had someone to be mean to you? Have you ever had someone speak gossip about you? Uh, better yet, have you ever done something that wasn't godlike towards someone else? Well, you know what? During those times of opposition, we ought to go to God's Word and find out what do we do during this time. When persecution comes and when opposition comes and we all face it, what do we do during those difficult times? And we have learned through this series that God always oh, bigger than our religion. God is bigger than our sin. God is bigger than my blindness, spiritually speaking. God is bigger than our past. God is bigger than my day. God is bigger than what I expect and what you expect. And I want you to know that God is bigger than your opposition. And through this series of right-sizing everything in our lives, simply put, this study is to help us to learn and put God where He belongs in our lives. In church, you don't need to look at the notes to find this answer. You should know this if you are saved from your heart. Where does God belong in our lives? He belongs in what place? He belongs what, church? First place. Let's say it together. I think some of you are already starting to pass out. It's a little warm in here. How many are warm? How many are okay? Well, then, okays, let's stay awake. Amen? And uh, for you that are, are a little bit warm, uh, nudge one another. Kind of give them the elbow in church. Amen? If they're falling asleep. And to help them out to stay alert for God's Word. But we know that the first place that God should have in our lives, let's say it together, is what place, church? First place! That's where God belongs. God doesn't belong, uh, hey, listen, behind your hobby, sir. God doesn't belong, man, behind your shopping. He goes before it. He goes before your school. He goes before your marriage. He goes before your church. He goes before your denomination. He goes before your children. We have a, a, a problem in America, and, and, and we've forgotten what's on our monetary note. In God we trust. We trust ourselves more than we trust God. And we don't put God first a lot of the times. It's easy to put God on a shelf and to put God in second place. But we are desiring to emphasize in the Christian life where God belongs. And that is for our life to be uh, filled with Christ and, and, and live out what matters most in the Christian life. And that is found. You're in Acts chapter 15. Can I hear an amen there? Keep your bookmarker there. And look at Acts chapter 9 and look at this verse, verse 16. Look at the end of Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Here it is. This is what it's all about. No matter what message is preached, no matter what church you go to, this ought to be the resounding theme. Every time you sign up for a ministry, every time you sing a song, every time you do anything for the cause of Christ, for religious sake, whatever that may be, because we're not religious people, we are in a relationship with a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. But here it is. Here's the resounding theme. Here is, I desire, as it was for Paul in Acts chapter 9, at the end of verse 16, notice it. It's the last four words of verse 16. Here it is. For my name's sake. Can we say that? Ready to begin. For who should we be living unto? Four words. For why should we come to church, Christian? Why should we sing about God? Why should we lift our hands up in service? I don't like it, preacher. You're not doing it for me. You're not doing it for the uh, snobby person beside you. We get so worried about who, who, who likes what and who, who's looking. You know what? When you grab a hold to this principle for Jesus only, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, listen, because he lives, I was covered in sin and shame. 
But because he lives, I've been given a new name. I am no longer a sinner but a saint. Saul is no longer Saul but Paul. There is something that Christ does when a person gets saved. The Bible says all things are passed away. Behold, all things become, come on, new. Listen, I, my life is lived for a different purpose now. It's not for Larry. It's not for you, ma'am. It's not for you, sir. It's for his name's sake. And when you can get a hold of that into your heart and to your spirit, it'll change everything. The way you look at things, the way you hear things, the way you speak things, the way you live out your life, it'll change your life when you grab and gravitate to this principle. Hey, my life is lived unto Jesus. And I don't care who likes it or who doesn't like it. I just want to please my Savior. That was Paul's heart. But I'm going to tell you, look up here. When you don't have this, when you don't have a big God, and you are big, and he is small, you're going to live discouraged. You're going to live in defeat. And you're going to live your life unto you. And my friend, you're going to be a miserable Christian. Why? Because you're living out of the will of God for your life. And God wants something different for you. And I want you to turn back to Acts chapter 15 now. And we have been on this journey and through this process we learned there were five ministry patterns. I'm going to bring them up on the screen now, all five of them together. But this is the one that we're focusing on right now. If you click that uh, for me, Miss Dottie, there is that we are focusing on number two. Let's say that word together. Ready, begin opposition. How many of you like opposition? Would you raise your hand? Wow, no, nobody. None of us like that. But how many of you know that we're not immune to it? Can I hear an amen? Not a, none of us are above it. I don't care how good of a Christian you are. I don't care how good of a saint you think you are in Jesus Christ. None of us are above opposition. It comes. I don't like it, Sherry. Do you like it? Do you want some of it? I bet you'll get some of it this week. Say, how do you know, preacher? Because if you live the Christian life for his name's sake, you can expect it. Matter of fact, it's just a way of life. Stop complaining about it. But there is a remedy that you can get and have to get you through. See, stop praying to get around it. And won't you pray for the grace and strength of Christ to get through it? That's what God wants for your life. And I'm saying to you that through this opposition, there are some principles that you and I can put in our life that will help us. And all of us would agree this morning that God is bigger than our hardships. God is bigger than our trials. He's bigger than our opposition. He's bigger than our difficulty that we may face uh, day to day on this earth. And that is the truth. And we all know that we're all going to go through times of hurt, through hardship and rough times on this journey with Christ. Guess what? That's what this sin-cursed world is about. It brings hardships. But thank God for the Christian, there is a better day coming. But until Christ calls us home, what do we do now? What do we do now? What do we do now? How do I live this life now? Because that's where the struggle is. I won't have any struggle in heaven. I won't have any worries in heaven. Uh, by the way, there won't be any messages in heaven. won't be any preachers in heaven. Amen. And uh, we will be singing unto the King of Kings. He will be the message. And I thank God for that. But let me say to you, this will help you living out the Christian life where you are. So, I've been sharing some principles with you last time. Not last week, but the week before uh, when I was here. Um, thank God for the men that stood in the pulpit and preached while my family were on vacation. Thank God for our church family allowing us to do and have that much needed time together as a family. But uh, last time when we were together, I shared with you one principle, and it's already filled out on your handout, and I'd like for you to look at it, and that is when opposition comes, I want you to remember this first thing. Number one, in your handout, it says this, locate other mature Christians for wise counsel on the matter. Say what matter? Whatever the matter is that brings opposition. Whatever it may be. I'll, I'll, I'll show you according to Acts chapter 15. Would you look at verse 1? And notice this opposition that has come. 
The Bible says in Acts chapter 15, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of who? Ye cannot be saved. Uh, guess what? I have one word to describe that verse. Guess what it is? Ready? You ready? You ready? Problem! Right? How many know that you are saved through faith, grace alone? Can I hear him? Amen. amen. What does that verse say? Unless you come through Moses, you cannot be saved. Does your Bible say you cannot be saved? My Bible says you cannot be saved. Did I misinterpret the scripture or does it say you cannot be saved? Is that what your Bible says? Well, either we don't know what the scripture says or we will twist it to make it say what we want to say it or we must understand scripture rightly divided in its context and realize when it says under Moses or through Moses you cannot be, be saved, we must understand that through Moses, through the law, through the religious system of this time period that we're reading about, this was a practice that had to take place as a branding, if you will, as an identification, if you will, like we do baptism as an outward identification. This was an identification with the nation of Israel. If you are among those who follow God, guess what? Circumcision must be received. Unless you, don't follow, unless you follow Moses, you can't be saved. That is a problem. And so already we start to see that even through the cross work of Jesus Christ, this book, Acts Time Period, is a transitional book. And the cross work has already happened. Christ did away with the law. He fulfilled the law in all points and did it without sin. He fulfilled all the law. He did away with the law. Not the law doesn't have a purpose, but we are saved through faith in Christ alone. And so therefore we know that it's not through the law. It's not through an outward thing. It's through a circumcision made without hands. It's through a circumcision that the Spirit of Christ does. And so therefore we know that verse 1 is, is a problem. And what happens is, is that way too many important decisions that Christians make are made in isolation. You have a few people here in this chapter that get together and go, you know what, we hear what's being said, but we like, we like it the way that we think it should be. We don't like this new teaching. We're not so sure about what's it, what else is being revealed because new revelation was being revealed through the Apostle Paul and Barnabas and others of the cross work of Jesus Christ. And therefore, these individuals have come now and they are saying that unless you are, are abiding through circumcision for the Jewish nation, reminding them of the covenant that God had made with His people... It was, a, it was God's mark of ownership and branding, if you will, about them that belonged to Him and to Him alone. And this is a problem. But I find it interesting what immediately happens. Would you look at verse 2? Problem in verse 1. Everyone say problem. Well, may I say to you, it's easy to come up with a problem. By the way, um, all of us can talk about problems. But I have found that talking about the problem doesn't help. You know what helps the problem? Finding a solution. And anyone can talk about the problem, but talking about the problem in itself doesn't resolve the matter. This is important. This is a key, relevant, and practical help for every Christian. Look at verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, oh, apparently they're discussing the matter. And it's not going all that well. They're having a little bit of an argument, if you will. Notice they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So, hey, look up here. We're not real sure now. We ought to discuss this matter, and it's an important matter to discuss, but let's get some others involved so that we can get some wise counsel on the matter. That's why it's important that when opposition comes to you, Christian, when opposition comes in your life, locate other mature Christians to get wise counsel, biblical counsel, 
on the matter that you may be facing. I love this verse. It's on the screen. Proverbs 24, 6. For by wise counsel, there shalt make thy war. And in multitude of counselors, there is safety. I'm so thankful that the Bible says there is protection. There is rescue. There is deliverance. There is salvation. There is victory in uh, counsel. When you seek out other mature Christians and believers... No matter what it is, if it's a job change, if it is a, a, about a purchase, if it is about relationships, let me say to you, it is important to have those individuals in your life that you can go to and get sound, uh, wise, biblical counsel from. Another verse that is helpful is from Proverbs as well. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is what church what's that verse say wise guess what will you listen today will you hearken that word hearken means to listen if you will listen the bible says you are a wise person i have three children all of them are uniquely different do you know that on any given day, and this might be surprising and shocking to you, so everybody right now go, Whoa! There have been times in the past that not all three or one of the three children have not listened to their mommy and daddy. What's the response? That's not really shocking, is it? When you don't listen... It indicates you're not a wise person. When you don't listen to God, listen to me, Christian. When you don't listen to Jesus Christ, and he's written a book. So I don't know what Jesus is saying. Sure you do. He wrote a book, 66 of them. Jesus wrote a book. It's called the B-I-B-L-E. God wrote a book. He put his thoughts down in a book. And that is his instruction, his love letter to you and I. It would be wise for you to listen to God. How can you listen to Him? Get in His book. That's what creates wise Christians. When you get in any situation that proves to be contentious or oppositional, quickly surround yourself with wise counsel. How many times have you talked with someone about a serious matter and, 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 and you have talked with someone about something and while you're talking with him about that, and you were just laying out your heart, it could have been something uh, spiritual, it could have been something uh, job-related, relational, it could have been anything, but to you it was important, and you laid out your heart, and that person who is a Christian never even offered to pray with you about that situation. Don't you find that strikingly odd? You should. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks to the Lord. We should be a praying people. This person never offered to search the scriptures with you. They never even offered to get other Christians involved with you to help consider the matter. Listen, it is a wise person that locates other mature believers doing oppositional times to help them get biblical counsel. It's important. That's the first thing. The second thing that I'd like to point out to you that will be helpful to you during opposition is found in verse 7. Would you look at verse 7, Acts chapter 15, verse 7? And look at this verse. And when there had been much disputing, that's interesting, that you see that all through the books of Act, the book of Acts, when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said to them, notice, it's still going on, still contentious, men and brethren, notice these next two words, ye know. Could you say that, ready, begin, ye know. Say it again. Ye know. When opposition comes, has God wrote a book, yes or no? Has he wrote a book that will help you in every situation, yes or no? He sure has. Then my second help to you today, if you take notes, and many of you do, is to write this in. 
Not only locate other mature Christians for wise counsel in the matter, but number two, listen to God's heart on the matter. Listen to God's heart on the matter. You know what you ought to do, Christian? Would you look up here? Start with what you know. You may not understand the problem that you're going through or the opposition that you're facing. You may not understand the bad report that you just got from the doctor. You may not understand the grieving process that you're going through right now. And everyone at some point in their Christian life has questioned God. We all have. But Christian, may I derive you and get you back to the source of strength and the source of hope and encouragement and consolation that comes through Christ. And that is for you to go to the Bible and start with what you know. I believe that the Bible is our source of strength. And everyone, by the way, everyone at times will focus and magnify what they are included in or what they are included or what they're not included in. I find it interesting how sometimes people often talk about what they don't know or that they didn't know at first. They focus on information that they think they should have gotten first, but they didn't from another individual. And instead of helping the individual about the problem that they're facing, they're more upset that they weren't told about it first. My friend, let me tell you something. You should not be my first avenue to get my consolation from. My first avenue and source of hope and encouragement and source of a solution should always be to God first. I should be your second or third or fourth person that you go to. God should always be your first. Can I hear an amen there? Go to God first. And the Bible says in verse 7, according to that, ye know they started with what they knew. Now let's read through verse 11. So let's read verse 7 again and then read through verse 11. 11. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us. Notice this, here's something new, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Remember, he was sent to the house of Cornelius. This is the first time that God ever sent a Jew unto a Gentile at this point, and Peter was reminding them, God told him to do it. Peter didn't do it willingly. He did it reluctantly, but he nevertheless did it anyway. And he reminds them, God's not just reaching to the nation of Israel today. He is reaching to the Gentile nation. And notice verse 8. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did us. He's doing the same thing as he did for us to them. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts. Uh-oh, by what? Verse 1, we read about circumcision. You must go back to the law of Moses. Eh, Go back to verse 8 and look at it. He says, verse 9, excuse me, purifying their hearts by faith. Verse 10, now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Why in the world would you Go back to an issue like circumcision, and we're not having that problem today, obviously, but why would you go back to the problem and go back to the problem and go back to the problem when God has given a remedy for that problem? Why wouldn't you automatically go to the solution? And Peter was reminding them that were there, you know what? Even our fathers and our forefathers and all of them couldn't bear the yoke of the law, and yet we're telling them to go back to the law. That doesn't make sense. Then, verse 11, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they... Can I hear an amen there? Even by grace we shall be saved. So, when opposition comes, listen, get God's heart on the matter. You know your first thing ought to, uh, your first question ought to be when problems or opposition comes your way, you ought to, your first question ought to be this. What does God have to say about it? Do you hear me, Christian? What does God have to say about it? I'd like for you to do this. Would you grab your Bible, keep your book in Acts chapter 15? Would you hold it up just like this? 
Come on now. Do a little exercising. We need to do a little more of that anyway. Amen? This is some of the heaviest weights some of you have lifted all week, other than a ham biscuit. All right? Amen. Let's lift it up. Don't put it down. Don't put it down. Don't put it down. Hold up just for a second. While you're holding up, I want to say this to you. Hold it up because I'm watching you. I got the cameras on you. I'm going to look at the video later. Folks, this is who we are. Do you see it? You that are watching or listening, if you're listening, you can't see it. We're holding up our Bibles. This is who we are. This is our banner. This is what we live unto. This is what we stand for. We are a Bible church. And we believe that the Bible is the final authority for our lives. We believe that this Bible is the sole source of truth and that it is divinely inspired and that this book is without error. Can I hear an amen there? This book is our life. We don't go to another source. We don't go to Facebook. We go to the book. We go to the Bible. We don't go to another book. We don't go to angels. We don't go to a priest. We don't go to the pastor. We don't go to the elders. We don't go to the deacons unless there is a need for more spiritual counsel. Listen, we first locate God's heart and listen to what he has to say about the matter. What does God have to say? Amen. You can put your Bible down. Put it back in your lap. This is God's book. This is our book. This is our banner. This is who we are. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it's on the screen. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for uh, a correction, for instruction. Notice, listen, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We believe that the Bible is profitable. There is fruit, there is benefit from every Christian being in the Bible. That's why we don't apologize for it. That's why we don't back off on the Bible here, no matter what event that we have. Listen, we don't do away with the Bible. You're going to get a Bible lesson when you come to our church. Why? It's who we are. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Hey, check it. Yes, God used ordinary men, but it was through the Holy Spirit that this book was written. We believe that this book is totally reliable because it is infallible. This book is to be believed. If you've been here any length of time, you know that I'm passionate about teaching God's Word. And you know that I'm passionate about the Bible being preeminent here in all things from the singing to the preaching. And that we emphasize strongly here uh, that Christians are to be rooted and grounded in God's truth. Simply put, we are people of truth. We are a people of truth. We believe that the preaching and teaching of God's Word is the catalyst for change in people's lives and therefore holds the highest priority. Did you hear me? God's Word is what changes people's lives. I don't care how many verses of the song you sing. I don't care if you can lay the Bibles out. But until you get people in the Bible, it is God's Word and God's Word alone that changes lives. We also believe here that freedom, that as believers we are striving to live out God's Word in a daily manner. We learn the Bible so we can live the Bible. That's our theme around here. Learning it to live it. And that which should be natural and normal for the Christian who is in God's Word on a daily basis. My friend, if you are in God's Word daily, you will be a growing and rooted, strong Christian. I believe that. And all of us that are saved here would agree with this totally and without question what I just said. However, I want you to get this statement. This is going to come up on the screen. It's not in your handout. If you want to write it down, that's fine. Is that you can get the letter of the law and miss God's heart. What I'm going to talk to you about now from this point on is going to be very sensitive. I want you to listen to me very clearly. You can get the letter of God's word. You can have all the Ten Commandments memorized. And some of what I'm about to say is going to be very sensitive to some of you. I don't apologize that, and we will take God's word and his stand on it. But it is wrong for the Christian 
to be able to quote God's Word, know His Word, and not be loving towards others through His Word. And you can have the law of the letter down and miss God's heart. And that's why I want you to, to really get point number two. Listen to God's heart on the matter. Listen to Him. Here's what I mean. Paul made this statement in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. It's on the screen. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Notice on the screen. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth what? The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. You see, a Christian can know a lot about the Bible, and a Christian can quote a lot of Scripture, but still not have God's heart on the matter. I'm going to tell you, some of the meanest, nastiest people I've ever met have been Christians. I haven't always been nice as a Christian. I haven't always been pleasant. Neither of you. You said some nasty things as a Christian. I bet you even said things... Uh, even in your heart, that maybe weren't verbalized, but you thought it within your heart that we're not pleasing to God. We're all capable of this. I know that a Christian can be, be as mean, hateful, contentious, unkind. A Christian can be unforgiving and not gracious towards others. A Christian can be right in their doctrine, listen to me, but wrong in their demeanor. They can be right and quote the Scripture word for word, but be wrong in their demeanor in how they do it. A Christian can be perfectly right with their hermeneutics and their homiletical approach to the Scripture, but be wrong in how they handle other believers. A Christian can be right about any issue, but wrong in the way they approach it or handle that issue. You can get the letter of the law, friend, but miss God's heart about it. And I want to go over some ways that we can get the law of the letter right, but miss God's heart on it. You ready, church? You ready? I want you to listen to me. I'm going to cover a few very sensitive topics right now. And all of us are going to agree on it, but I just want to make sure we get God's heart on it. And the first one is homosexuality. How many of you agree with me that homosexuality is a sin according to God's Word? Is that true or false? It's true. Hold on. You can get the letter on, the, on that, and we are absolutely right. God says it's a sin. And we understand that, but in dealing with that issue with other people, we miss God's heart on it. We can become so law-minded that we lose the sight that this church, Christians, ought to be a loving and saving and redeeming and welcoming and forgiving and gracious church to all regardless of their sin. This church ought to be willing to accept anyone in this church and in this building and into this fellowship regardless of their background. Listen to me closely. We will not excuse or ignore sin here. But we should be lovingly and graciously pointing people to Jesus Christ. Did you hear me? You can get the law right. Amen, God hates homosexuality. Yeah, but you sound hateful in saying that. So they can't see God's love through it because the only interpretation they have of God is through you and you're coming across pretty hateful. How will you ever reach them? How will you ever minister to them? Does God love the homosexual, yes or no? He sure does. He loves you, you rotten sinner. Oh, this may not be your sin, but I bet I'll get to it. I want you to understand this. 
Jesus died and res was resurrected to save sinners. Jesus died and was resurrected to forgive sin. And Jesus died and was resurrected to give victory over sin. Can I hear an amen on that? Amen. amen. Praise God. However, are you listening? Hold on. Hold the phone. Jesus didn't die and was resurrected not so the church could keep its reputation. Did you hear me on that? Say, well, oh, what kind of church will we become if we allow those sinners into our church? We'll be Christ's church. Christ came to seek and save that which was lost. Who are you seeking and trying to reach? I want to be God's church, not some religious de denominational church. I just want to be a church that pleases the Lord. I'm not saying it'll be easy. I'm not saying there will be opposition. I just want to make sure that I have God's heart on the matter. Listen, it doesn't matter what category of sin that person may be struggling with. We want you to know that are listening to me right now, they're watching this. We want you to know that God loves you. We want you to know that we love you. And we want to help you get free from that sin and from the bondage that you are in. We aren't judging you. We aren't lording over you. We aren't standing over top of you, condemning you. But we will tell you the truth. And we will tell you the truth so the truth will set you free. We want all that God has for you. We want Him to be for you and all that He has for you through His Son, Jesus Christ. But only the truth of Jesus Christ will set you free from the bondage of sin that you're in. Listen, no church membership will set you free. Uh, 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 no church membership or attendance. No local government will set you free. No legislation will set you free. No written court appeal or Supreme Court decision will render forgiveness and produce righteousness in a sinful heart. Hey, listen to me. None of these things will change your heart unless you get God's heart on the matter. And that is, is that He loves you and He sent His Son to die for you and that only through Jesus Christ can any of us be forgiven of our sin regardless of what the sin is. Only Christ can forgive sins. Hey, listen. You may have been saved for 60 years. That's awesome. But do you still love the sinner like God loves the sinner? Or have you grown bitter and indifferent because of what you've seen on TV and what people display in the community and other places? Make sure you listen to God's heart on the matter. How many of you would agree with this? That divorce is a sin, true or false? Oh, you got weak on that. I'm going to tell you why you got weak. Because most of you have lived this one, then you've lived the homosexuality one. Now, don't you back off on the truth because you're afraid of what others will think. I know where God's word stands. However, let's make sure we have God's heart on the matter. Divorce is a sin. God hates divorce. Why? Because it's a sin. But let me tell you something else, my friend. He also despises manipulative, punishing, abusive relationships that people are involved in. He hates that too. God hates the hypocrisy of many that appear to be faithful but sleep with their backs to their spouses. And all the while, sleeping with their backs to their spouses commit adultery through pornography or actual physical relationships with someone uh, to whom they are not married. Let me say to you, my friend, God hates that too. I think the rubber's hitting the road, is it not? By the way, if you're single, listen to me. Your affection as a single person should belong to Jesus only. Only Christ should have your heart. And if you love anything more than Christ as a single adult, you too are committing spiritual adultery. As a single, you have the opportunity to give your heart and your complete attention to God because you do not have a spouse. God wants all of us 
to love him with all our hearts and soul according to Deuteronomy 13.3. Listen to me. God hates divorce, but he loves divorced people. And I don't care what any church tells you. I will say it publicly. I preached on it for weeks here. God does not put people on the shelf because there's been sin on their li in their life. And not everybody that's been in a divorce has committed the sin of divorce. And I thank God that we have leaders and individuals in our church that can serve Christ and that have a clean testimony and a years that are blameless before Jesus Christ, even though in their past that they have had a divorce. I thank God that he still uses people like that. You can be right about the law but miss God's heart on the matter. Better get it. How about this? How, do, how about abortion? That's a sin, true or false? True. You know that God is for the sanctity and life of the unborn child? Unborn children have a right to life. Children who are born have some rights too, though. It is not God's plan for individuals in the name of God to take justice in their own hands. More bloodshed does not negate the sin of the innocent blood of babies being shed. Did you hear me this morning? I don't care what you see on TV and what people do in front of uh, abortion clinics and all of that. Let me tell you something. That does not represent God. You will not reach them by picketing and being hateful in the process. I have a question, though. What about the baby after it's born? Children have a right to be cared for. Wouldn't you agree? Children have a right to be loved. Children have a right to be fed and not abused. Shame on those of us who would fight for the unborn child, but not for the life of the born child. We ought to stand up for those that have been born. We ought to stand up for those who have no one to stand up for them. See, you can get the letter but miss God's heart. May I discuss another one with you before we close, and that is this. Sexual immorality, fornication or adultery, is that a sin, true or false? Yes. True. It is a sin. But let's get God's heart on the matter. See, we all have the law here, and we all would agree with that totally. But not only is sexual immorality sin, but thinking about someone sexually in your mind and in your heart is also a sin. By the way, so is gluttony. So is gossip. So is racism. And so on and so on and so the list goes. Are you with me today, church? We can get the law but miss God's heart. It's amazing, isn't it? How we hate the sin that others do, but we neglect the sin that we might often commit. Say, what do you mean? I'm going to put it up on the screen to make sure that we get it. Sometimes we hate the particular sin the most that we haven't done more than the ones we have done. Oh, it's easy to preach and speak against those things that we've never committed. Will you speak publicly against the ones that you have committed? See, we can get the law about the whole thing, but then miss God's heart on the matter. Let's not be a people or a Christian or a church of hypocrisy. There are so many right now that are right about the issue but wrong in the way that they approach it. I have done that. Have you? Have you ever been right about something biblically? I mean, right on the letter, right perfectly. I mean, you quoted the scripture, and boy, you felt good about it. You're like, showed them. Woo! Jesus must be proud. But your spirit during the whole thing was so wrong. And you saw that spiritual door shut into ministering or reaching that individual, not because you weren't right about what you said, 
because you were mean and approached the way that you did it or handled it. I think it's interesting that if you fail at love, but you succeed in pointing out what is right, and we are a church that stand for what's right. Man, that's, what, that's our foundation. We stand for what's right here. But if we fail to love others, may I say to you, church, we have failed. Did you hear me? If we haven't learned to love others as Christ has loved them, then we have failed. How many of you that are saved today would agree with me this morning that this Bible is to obey, would be obeyed? Would you agree with that this morning by saying amen? amen. This Bible is to be obeyed. Do you believe that? Yeah, amen? amen? How about some scripture on it? Would you turn with me to, you can leave Acts now. And would you look at Matthew 22? This will be the last scripture that you have to look at or turn to. Matthew 22. I believe the Bible should be obeyed. You believe the Bible should be obeyed. Every Christian should believe that the Bible is to be obeyed. What about Matthew 22, verse 37? What about this? Have I done this? Have you done this? Have you lived this out? Have you obeyed this? Matthew 22, verse 37. If you're there, say amen. amen. Jesus said unto them, obviously in verse 36, they come to him and ask a question. Look at verse 36. Master, what is the greatest commandment in the law? I got the law, but man, what's the number one deal? Man, just give me the number one. Give me the answer. I want to know what's the most important thing. Look what Jesus said, verse 37. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. What? Yep, and uh, this is the first and greatest commandment. But there's a number two, verse 39, and, and the second is like unto it. Really, they're not really inseparable. What is it? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 40, Boy, he sums it up. He puts a caboose on it. Puts a bow on it. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You, you can teach a life group, Sunday school class for 40 years and not have God's heart about it. You, you, you can sing the song with the best of them. You can play the guitar better than any of them. You, you, you can showcase the talent and ability that God's given you among the best of them. And be as wrong in your heart as anyone. Why? Because you don't love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And... Everybody say, and. And you love your neighbor as yourself. May our church be a loving church. Paul was in agreement with Jesus, and he said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13 on the screen, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. Man, those are great things, and, and these are what a, a Christian is, and what should abide in a Christian, and what should display in a Christian, and what should uh, uh, typify of a Christian. But the greatest of these is love, charity. How loving have you been? So, pre preacher, way back then, no, what about with this past week? How loving will you be this week? Greatest thing that you could do through oppositional times is display the love of Christ to others. What if you are guilty of being so firm in your belief? What if you are so 
firm in your belief on the screen, which may be right. You are right about it. But you're wrong in the way you've loved others and handled the matter. You are so right. Well, I'm going to ask Dottie that you'd back up one screen. Here's a great answer for that. Romans 3.10 Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. <laughs> Want to hand on to the Spirit? Want to solve a problem? Want to defuse a time bomb about ready to go off? Be loving. Why? Because this is what takes care of it. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Do you know how, how I and you can fulfill the Ten Commandments just like that? Be loving. Man, I can do the Ten Commandments right now by loving those even in sin. Hey, by the way, not just those that sin like I do, but those that sin in the issues that I don't sin in. So that's where it really comes down to. Having God's heart about the matter. So, if you bring that question back up, Dottie, what if we are guilty of being firm in our belief? We're right. We got the law down. We know it. Thus saith the Lord. God said it. We stand for it. Amen and amen. What do we do? Well, here it is. It's the same thing in your handout, and I'd like for you to look at it, and let's review, and then we're done. You ought to locate other mature Christians for wise counsel on that. Get some other mature Christians around you, praying with you, seeking biblical counsel about it. And then secondly, you know what? Listen. Listen to God's heart on the matter. Listen to God's heart on the matter. So today, have you been listening to God? Not to me. But have you been listening to God? What about this past week? I guarantee you he's been talking. Matter of fact, he's been talking all week long. Say, how do you know? He's been talking through his book. Have you been in it? If you haven't been in it, you haven't been listening. But you also can be in it and not hearken. You can read it, but reading doesn't mean listening. You know what follows listening? Obedience. That's right. I think someone said it. When I listen to God, I obey Him. But when I find myself not obeying His Word, loving others, I find that where the problem was very quickly. It's because I wasn't listening. I won't obey. I won't love. Because I won't listen. How many of you would agree with me this morning by saying amen? All of us can be a little hard-headed. Yeah. God would like to knock the cobwebs out of your head this morning if you'd let him. He'd like to get rid of that so you can hear him and see him only. With every head bowed and every eye closed.